Left orphaned by a tragic event, a person forever preserves the image of their parents in the brightest and warmest corner of their soul. The positive image of James Potter comes into significant doubt in the fifth book. Diving into Snape's memories, we see the protagonist's father in an unflattering light, sparking many contradictions. On one hand, he is a hero of the First Wizarding War, having endured great hardships due to the Dark Lord's pursuit. A hero who paid with his life. Yet Potter's personality could have been tarnished by a plethora of unseemly qualities and actions, prompting us and many other fans of J.K. Rowling's works to question what this prominent character was truly like. So let's try to form as unbiased an image of the wizard as possible. James was born to the pure-blooded magicians, Fleamont and Euphemia Potter. The parents had long struggled to have children, so his birth was a real joy for them. His father received his name in honor of his grandmother, who bore the surname Fleamont and wished to immortalize herself in history. Harry's grandfather was skilled in duels. He claimed to have reached unparalleled heights precisely by defending the honor of his name, battling other students who dared to mock the young wizard then. Fleamont created a magical hair care potion, Sleek Easy's hair potion, which Hermione successfully used before the Yule Ball to style her hair and shorten her lengthy locks. Thanks to the sale of this potion's production company, the Potter family fortune was amassed. James grew up in a wealthy family, and such things do not go unnoticed. Upon entering school, he befriended three students. The motives behind his choices also merit clarification. With Sirius, the connection is clear. The boys were similar, and Sirius grew up in luxury, as the noble and ancient House of Black was associated with significant wealth and influence. But that's not the only thing that bonded him to James. Upon being sorted into Gryffindor, Sirius's family began to distance themselves from him, comparing him unfavorably with Regulus, his younger brother. Amid all these conflicts, Sirius left home, strengthening the bond between the two boys. Both were unwilling to compromise with differing viewpoints. James's parents accepted their son's friend as one of their own, and soon Sirius's uncle Alphard left him a house and a sizable inheritance. This is how these two characters became friends. But how did Remus and Peter end up in the group? Pettigrew was never known for his bravery, so he sought protectors. He found one in a peer who embraced the role enthusiastically. Wormtail admired prongs fueling James's vanity and pride. Mooney, on the other hand, had been a withdrawn child from the age of five and only found friends at school. Lupin was intelligent and hardworking, while James relied on luck and happenstance. However, luck alone wouldn't get you very far. Potter played on his house's Quidditch team. Many mistakenly believe that Potter played as the Seeker, but J.K. Rowling herself stated that James was a chaser. This error was created by her, as the first mention of him as a player is introduced in the film right after Harry is appointed to the team position. Snape's memories, where the Chosen One's father toyed with the snitch, reinforce this theory. Recall what was written on James's award in the trophy room. The golden shield was engraved with initials in the word Seeker. However, this inscription can be interpreted differently. Logically, the Seeker searches for the tiny golden ball. He hunts it down and captures it. But wait, hunters are the ones who hunt. So this role seems more fitting for a student. Moreover, one must not forget that Quidditch is a team sport, meaning the talent of one player is insufficient unless you're a Seeker who catches the coveted ball within the first seconds of the match. By the way, all who claimed James was an excellent player were close friends or mentors of Harry, except perhaps for Snape. How very like your father you are, Potter. Astonishing, Snape said unexpectedly, and his eyes sparkled. He too was exceptionally arrogant, somewhat luckier than others on the Quidditch pitch, and so full of pride, strolling around the school surrounded by friends and admirers. Yes, the resemblance is indeed supernatural. It turns out that James did have some success in Quidditch, but how did he get into the team? There are two possibilities. The first one is that young Potter had talent and passed the selection trial, as a result of which he was taken as a chaser. The second one is, having wealthy parents, he pulled off a scheme similar to Draco Malfoy's. Expensive broom, financing, influence, and prestige within the magical community. However, considering the above, we lean towards luck and parental assistance. Wait, you might say, Harry was confidently handling a broom from his first flying lesson. And you would be right. 
The situation with the Chosen One was the same, and the professor of herbology was in no way exaggerating. Over the years, Potter himself admitted that he was lucky, talented friends, fortuitous circumstances, the Wheel of Time, the Marauder's Map, assistance from the Order of the Phoenix, Dumbledore's Double Game, and again, luck. Remember how Harry was upset about his broom that ended up in the Whomping Willow? Or Ron's broken wand? There was no obstacle to going to Diagon Alley and fixing these minor annoyances. It turns out that only fortune and a periodic reduction in the level of stupidity helped both James and Harry throughout their lives. Much depended on wealth, spoiling their character, and causing the two troublemakers to often find themselves in awkward situations. Sirius and James behaved carelessly towards rules and other castle inhabitants. They constantly played pranks, spied on others, and bullied other students. Even Lily initially disliked James. He was proud of his noble origin and talent since everything came to him without effort. Moreover, Potter rudely joked about Vernon, Lily's sister's husband, for his muggle interests. And the major sin many fans cannot forgive him for is his bullying of the reclusive and antisocial Severus Snape, who was in love with Lily all his life. Can James be considered a positive character when he humiliated Severus in front of the love of his life? A big question. The situation is extremely unpleasant. Let's move to the fifth part of the Potter series, into Snape's memories left in the pensive. Harry sees an unpleasant scene. After exams, the marauders went to a sunlit meadow. Lupin pulled out a book and immersed himself in it. Sirius, with a disdainful and bored look, glanced at the students. James was still playing with the snitch, allowing it to fly further and further away. Each time James performed a particularly complicated throw, Wormtail gasped in admiration and started clapping. After about five minutes, Harry wondered why James didn't ask Wormtail to behave. But James, it seemed, enjoyed the attention. Then Sirius complained about being bored, to which the elder Potter replied, We'll have some fun now. Everyone remembered the greeting towards Severus that escalated into a scuffle in which the future potions master lost. However, the other side of the situation indicates that despite students' disapproval of Snape, the entire conflict was based on a desire to show off in front of others and assert themselves at the expense of someone they considered inferior. And as Harry himself stated, he knew what it was like to be humiliated in front of others. He knew exactly how Snape felt when his father tormented him, and if what he saw in the pensive was anything to go by, Snape wasn't exaggerating when he called his father an arrogant braggart and a show-off. It turns out that Senior Potter, much like Black, was far from being a noble Gryffindor student. A sadist, a blackmailer, and a lover of attacking two against one without warning, having prepared beforehand. That's how he presented himself. The conflict began even before their first year on the train to Hogwarts, due to Severus and James's disagreement over the choice between the rival houses. Again, the question arises, why not avert this conflict? One grew up in wealth and luxury, the other in deprivation and pain, and often that's enough to ignite an internecine war. Moreover, James conflicted with Severus over Lily Evans, whom Snape loved. We understand that Snape at one point spoke disparagingly about Lily, but from the outside, it seems merely a pretext to hurt Snape. And remember how the inseparable quartet called themselves. Wormtail, Mooney, Padfoot, and Prongs informally identified themselves as marauders. By definition, marauders were people engaged in looting on battlefields or evacuated areas. It's only speculation as to why the students chose such epithets. History has not preserved the composition of James and Sirius's school pranks, which Lupin sometimes joined. But we remember the snitch stolen by Potter in his fifth year. Sirius also stole newspapers during his wanderings after escaping from Azkaban. Whether such naming was a broad gesture towards the mystique of status or simply thoughtless maximalism of the boys is unknown. But enough about Potter's character and behavior in school. The events of 1981 portray James as a reckless wizard. He and his wife defied the Dark Lord three times, so he surely understood what they would face after Riddle became aware of the prophecy. And in this situation, everything is poor. The only thing protecting the Potter's home was the Fidelius charm. For those who don't recall, it's a special spell that conceals the location of a place from unwanted persons. The charm's uniqueness lies in the involvement of a so-called secret keeper. 
The secret of the charm is sealed in their heart and cannot be extracted by any means. The keeper can only reveal the location of the object voluntarily, but it cannot be forcibly extracted with spells, truth serum, or under torture. Dumbledore initially offered his candidacy, but James and Lily saw Sirius in this role, and guess who eventually had the honor of guarding the secret of the house's location? Peter Wormtail Pettigrew. No one would suspect such a non-entity as Wormtail to be your keeper. That was Black's argument in favor of the schoolmate. This act not only surprises us, it shocks the entire magical community. The only way James's stupidity could be justified is if Fidelius was accompanied by an unbreakable vow, whereby Pettigrew was obliged to keep the secret under threat of death, and to cast Protego Maxima, Fianto Duri, Repello Muggletum, and Muggle Repelling Charms on the house. According to scenes shown in the first and last films, we hear Potter shouting, Go, I'll hold him off. Lily locks herself in a room, holding baby Harry to her chest, and sits on the floor. That's all. Two wizards, members of the Order of the Phoenix, who defied the Dark Lord three times. They should have been sleeping with a pile of amulets around their necks and wands in their hands. Why not, instead of barricading the passageway, arrange a couple's apparition to a prearranged location as a backup plan and escape route? If they didn't have their wands, which is doubtful, Lily could have fled with the child herself. No logic can be found in his actions from the beginning to the end of the tragedy. Harry Potter was left an orphan due to his parents' foolishness, especially his father's. It turns out he was also a poor husband, given that Lily didn't express her concerns about a dubious, though friendly agreement to become the keeper so readily. Despite Pettigrew's lack of intellect, courage, resilience, and the heroism of a true Gryffindor, we noticed none. And if you placed Dumbledore, Sirius, and Pettigrew side by side, and the choice fell on the latter, you inevitably wonder whether to send Lily Potter Evans for treatment at St. Mungo's Hospital. After all, the Keeper could have been James himself, or they could have made, for example, Lily. A perfectly workable scheme which was later practiced by Bill at Shell Cottage and Mr. Weasley at Auntie Muriel's house. As you can see, that was James Potter from his school days to his death in Godric's Hollow. Now let's take a deep breath and find out what you think about this. Was James an exemplary family man? And were all the pranks just remnants of his school years? Or perhaps he was indeed so focused on his own ego that he saw nothing around him except for Lily and Sirius. In the end, was saving Snape in the passage under the Whomping Willow an act of nobility or a fear for his own friend's skins? Write in the comments how you feel about such a varied James Potter. Put forward your theories and assumptions, and also hit the magical bell to be the first to know about new videos. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. But that's all for now. Thank you, everyone, and see you again in the amazing world of wizardry and magic.